time I spoke at her class, she introduced me and had the Fred Sanford music playing when I walked up in front of her class. But uh, we're going to push through this next section right here and then we'll take a break. We're doing real good on time. Um, I'm going to start with a disclaimer. When you go to talking about financials, you can cause a fight as quick as you can talking about tractor, truck, brand, or football team. So I'm not here to replace your CPA at all. I am here to get you to do some critical thinking and maybe think about something on your P&L and your financials that you've not been thinking about. And what sparked this was you get a lot of feedback when we do meetings. People want to understand financials more. The biggest feedback I get is when I go do budgets with people and I look at some of the numbers they put in and they're charging themselves $40 to run a combine across their field. That worked in 1992 maybe. But it doesn't work now if you want the true cost of operating and equipment in your <coughs> program there. When we talk about the farm market today, we can look over here on the left. What's your temperature? Some people are real hot. Some people are real cold. Definitely the risk level is off the charts right now. When you look at how financials are impacting what's going on, our markets, we got to increase demand. And the soybean board, the cotton board, the corn board, they're doing all they can trying to increase demand there. The hope this year for corn demand increase. The last couple of weeks when all those electric cars, they couldn't get them charged. Maybe that's going to give a little more push for ethanol to get a little growth. I think folks are starting to see how those things might not work in every situation. And so maybe that's going to give a boost to ethanol, which would increase some domestic demand for corn and get it out of the ugly number it's in. When you look at inputs, inflation and interest, thank goodness they're trending down. Because they were leading to the slides over there on the right. A lot of stress causes hypertension and make sure you focus on the top. When you look at labor, that's just ridiculous and through the roof and I don't understand it. It's a very good conversation last week at the soybean meeting about how in the world was the government mandate and the labor increase and expecting us to be competitive on a global market. Talk to your congressmen, your senators, your lobby groups that, that support the types of crops and livestock you grow and make sure that they are spreading the word. We've got to have some help there. Everybody needs to make a fair wage, but as I told you, person one time you don't need to retire just off of me. When we look at some things in finance, I listen to a bunch of podcasts and read a bunch of blogs and there's a couple areas we're just going to glance at today or two that I think are important. How many folks in here store grain? Sell labor? Didn't think there'd be many. We've got a luxury here a lot of people don't have. We're surrounded by meals here. We get a very high positive basis most of the time biggest thing where storage might would help us is when you got a four hour wait at Cargill or somewhere like that. I'm only picking on them because I used to work for them. Those things kind of limit, especially when weather's starting to factor in. But I'm hearing more people putting some storage in in their operation. But something you want to consider is the cost of storing that grain versus getting your check and paying your operating rate off. We're going to look at Joe Farmer here. Just a, a Picked it out of thin air example. It has 500 acres of corn, had an average year, it grew 500 acres, made 135 bushels, so he's got a little over 67,000 bushels to store. Soybean crop, he had an average year, he grew 500 acres and made 40 bushels to the acre. He's got 20,000 there. 
And he's sitting there looking at a $550,000 operating note. Well, sadly, the big number on that, when you look, we're going to say he got it real late last year and he's paying 9% on that note. A lot of younger farmers in here, interest has not been on your budget, really on your P&L, last 25 years probably. It is real now. And a lot of people are missing that in their budgets. A lot of people asked me last year why I had 30 plus dollars an acre in a budget. But when you look at an operating note and you see that's what it ended up being. It's a true number that a lot of folks were missing in their budget. They get to the end of the year and figure out why they didn't make any money. Well, my budget said I was going to make money, but there's not enough left in the bank at the end of the year. So what this is going to do is try to true that up to where you take a different look. This gentleman here, a lady, said they had the example they wanted to hold their grain for three months because when their prices are going to go up, they're going to go up. So they were very optimistic. So they put this in storage. This is an all-inclusive example. You may store it less. You may have less bushels. Your interest rate may be different. This is just for illustration purposes. But say he took that 9% note that was costing him right at $1,600 a month to not pay that money back. Well, what is that money going to be accounted for? Well, Jimmy helped me work on this. We put that in the bin. And you look, that's going to be almost $4,900 over that three months, just in interest <clears> alone. <throat> so if we divide that back out, as you'll see in your books there, over the number of bushels, you've got to go up seven cents to pay for the interest. Most likely it will hopefully go up seven cents in that three months. But there's some other numbers that aren't in there that you need to factor. You've got to pay for those bins. You've got to pay for the electricity. You've got to pay the labor. To run it in the bin, run it back out of the bin, and you got to pay for the freight. And a lot of farmers argue me on that. No, we didn't have to carry the cargill anyway. Yes, you're still going to have to pay that, but you had to carry it back to the house and unload it. So there is a freight trip in there that a lot of people miss. Make sure you account for that when you're looking at how advantageous it is for you to keep your beans or corn in storage. When you look at the bean example, you deal with the same amount of interest there. That comes up to 24 cent a bushel when you look at this example. Also, you got to add in the cost of that bin, the cost of the electricity, the cost of the labor, and that extra trip. Maybe you only carry it five miles from the field to home, and you may say, no, that's not much. That 18 wheeler was on the road. That was a risk that you had. It could have gotten in a wreck. You paid for that little bit of wear and tear. You paid insurance that day on. There are true costs associated with doing this. Just make sure you're re rewarded for whatever those costs are. When we look at the next one, it's the hot button, and I'm glad it came up a while ago. We look at the cost of equipment on the ship. And this one, just like the colors <coughs> of the tractors up there, can get all in the mud if you want it to. But we're going to look at a fake tractor here and say the purchase price is $400,000 on that tractor. And we're going to say you're somebody that doesn't let tractors get old on your farm you trade every five years. That might not be real for everybody in the room, but there may be some that it is. For this example, it's going to be real today. At the end of that five years, we're going to say your salvage value, whether you're trading in or selling, you get $200,000 out of that. Now, here's the one that will give you sticker shock. Stephen, I'm not picking on you about the price of, of, of tractors going up there. But this same tractor in this example that was used, and this came off of somebody else's site, that $400,000 tractor today in five years is probably going to cost somewhere around $532,000. So how do you account for that? Where do those dollars go in your budget? That's what this does. It gives you some formulas here. You can go home and plug your numbers into this and make it work. When you look at that replacement cost, Minus your purchase price today, it gives you $132,000 there of inflationary cost that you need to account for when you're looking at how much does it cost to run equipment over an acre every year. And you divide that out over this five year example, that's $26,000 that just appeared on your budget and you hadn't done anything. That's just keeping up with the pace of inflation of what it's going to cost to replace that equipment. You buy used equipment, 
Maybe you change these numbers down here. But if you're buying new, that's some real numbers there. When you look at inflation pacing like it's done the last few years, when you look at your depreciation there, and your accountant may factor it different, but if you take that purchase price minus your salary, you got that $200,000 you got to deal with over the five years of this example. That gives you another $40,000. So just in this alone, you've not turned the key on the ignition on the tractor. You've come up with $66,000 that you got to do something with in your finances, in your operations. And that's a lot of money that people overlook a lot of times. They just say, here's what my payments are for the year. And if I got enough in the bank, I'll go buy some more next year and create another payment. But if you really want to pace this thing out and keep up with it, you figure these numbers, and then you look at what you're doing with that tractor. This is more of a Midwest example, but say this is a tillage tractor that doesn't get a lot of use other than heavy tillage. Say this guy's got a 2,000 acre farm and he makes four pastures a year with his heavy tillage, whatever that may be. He does that for five years, so that ends up about 40,000 acres that that tractor is used over that five year life. When you add this number here all together and divide it out, that's $8.30 an acre just to own that tractor and it go across the ground to cover for inflation and depreciation on there. And I see a lot of people that say it costs $10 an acre for me to run my tractor to pull a plant. That's pretty close to being right. But are you counting what the planter costs? A lot of people miss that. A lot of people say it costs me $100 an acre for my equipment cost. This don't cost you that to run a cotton field. It's going to cost close to that to run a combine. But you got tillage, you got your planter. How many times are you spraying for plant bugs or stink bugs or every one of those tricks is going? The only reason I bring this up is not to dispute how you keep your record. I want you to go home and think about it and go, am I really calculating my budgets the way I should? Am I appropriating money to the places they should go on the budget there? Many different ways to calculate this. I'll leave that up to you and your CPA to do that. When you look at our budgets there in the book as well, the print is not very good. These numbers down here have not been updated since the fall. We know how things start changing rapidly after the first of the year. So there was no need to update those on the 5th of January when we came up with these and then not being valid today. In a couple weeks, we'll start emailing out budgets by stock every week when we do our Friday email to try to keep you up to date. But something I want you to look at on these budgets right here, some things you don't see there. And you don't see it on many budgets, whether you know we do them or local extension does them, doesn't matter. There's nothing on there that shows what your cell phone costs or the cost of your office if you sit in at the farm or the cost of insurance on your building that your office is in at your farm or the internet you've got there, professional subscriptions you got, those kind of things are not on these budgets. These are just basically input cost budgets. So when you do your budgets, make sure you add those things there. Make sure you add in what your payback to management is. You'll draw out of it per acre if you want to get a true view of your enterprise there. Now, we're going to kind of wind through seven things right here that I think are hot buttons right now that we are facing in the ag industry and some things that you can use crop insurance and other risk management tools to help protect you along the way. When we look at what's gone on the last few years, working capital has totally eroded over the last couple of years when you look at what things have gone on. The nest eggs aren't as big as they used to be. We have made some very good money when you look at top line numbers. But when you look at what the cost of inputs and labor and all those things are there, there's not a lot of money left over. And this would just encourage you don't overspend. As much as you want to go buy new this, that, and another, this is a time you might want to tighten up, hold on. When you look at grain inventory devaluation, last year, I'm talking 23, was the year some people got stung by this in two ways. One, if they had held some of their 22 crops to 
like the fire slide full of things are going to get a look. What if they held on to it? They could have sold it at 650 and that thing eroded <clears> down when they sold it. They didn't do anything and lost the value of that inventory right there. I know quite a few growers last year started <coughs> out to the book point in the six dollar range, six twenty five, and said, It's gonna be seven. They sold corn for five dollars. That opportunity cost was missed there. You gotta have a risk management plan, and that includes booking enough to cover your costs. Keeping a little bit back if you want to play the market and wait on it to go to seven dollars. That's different things you have to work out amongst yourselves there. We look at overhead expenses. These things have gone through the roof as well. Just make sure you're aware of what your true costs are. Living expenses, all of those things are going up. Principal and interest on equipment has gone up. When we look at cash flow, this is one that's really startling here. When you look at how much of your operating money and budgets are tied up due to just interest increase alone. Interest is up on operating up 71% over the last few years. It's been that much of a climb. Highest it's been in the last while was around 2008 and it was nowhere near as high as it is now. Crazy example here, but it's real. If you had a million dollar note last year, the interest rate was low, it cost you 30 grand for that note. You have done absolutely nothing different and gone and borrowed that same money this year. Interest could be $60,000. That's really the cost of an employee on your farm. And you've not changed anything the way you do it. That is why we got to get out and get more demand and higher prices for what we do. Because these things are real here. Do a budget stress test. And somebody might like, what in the world is that? Last year would have been a great year to do that. Most of us, when we figure our budgets, we look at B, the most likely case. Hey, I'm going to sell my corn for five fifty, and I'm going to grow 130 bushels to the acre. Some of us can dream and do the best case scenario and say it's going to go up to $8. Or we imagine a new truck and a new tractor and a big long trip somewhere. C is the one I want you to look at. Last year would have been a great year to do that. What if you didn't book? And you ended up selling for two dollars less than you potentially had got. Are your finances set the way you can handle a drop like this? Do a stress test. That's when you can take and look at tools like crop insurance guarantees. What is your floor there? What have you got billed as a floor? Can you stand this? When you look at that, you want to do a crop comparison. There's a tool that we got I can share with you. It can kind of compare your enterprise crop or your crop. Look at what it brings in. This year, I'd encourage you, look at your crop guarantees. Your soybeans going to bring in more, more profit than maybe corn or cotton. I don't know. Find out what works for you. Look at that. You'll need to consider crop rotation constraints. Maybe it is time to rotate corn. You've been corn on corn for two years, and you need to move corn, in, but it's going to marginal land. Maybe this is a year you talk to some of your neighbors about trading some land out if it's fruit traded or tobacco grown in your area and you work out a contract that will protect both parties on that and protect your interest. Maybe a new crop like sesame is something you can put into your rotation. It is available to be covered in the whole farm now and there's an APH policy <coughs> for it as well. So that's a new emerging crop that's getting a little traction. But those are things to consider. That's the Enterprise comparison tool there, we just does corn and beans, but that's something we can put in and do for you and help you kind of decide which one's going to work best for you. Now, my last point here on number seven here is you got to know when you made a profit. I'm like, what do you mean? If there's more money in the bank at the end of the year than there was to start with, you made a profit. Well, to make good decisions on when to sell, you got to really know when you've made money and when you haven't made money. Don't be a victim of just taking what you get. Have a plan in place. Know that target number that you need to hit to get your cost paid for. Then, like I said, if you want to take a percent and gamble, that's something you can go do. But you got to know that true production cost. And my point in this is to tell you, you need to update that every month. People worry about budgets before they plant, and then they forget about them and throw it out the window. They don't even think about it. When you get to August 
and you're looking out there at your crop and going, well, do I go see one of these guys and add a little more to it and invest or try to maximize that crop? Or has it gotten so bad that I need to cut my losses? We're just going to harvest it and take what we've got. If you don't know what your cost is and you don't know what you've got locked in for price by that time, you don't know if you need to make a, a gamble on that or not or another investment to try to do that. Here's one thing I will say, and all the, the chemical and fertilizer guys in here will, will agree with me. You cannot make a crop if you don't put the inputs to it. You can't save yourself in the prosperity of this. You gotta make good decisions and to try to push that crop along and get the most you can. My granddad always said, son, it doesn't matter what the market is, if you don't grow a crop, you don't have anything to sell, so it doesn't matter. If cotton's a dollar twenty-five or thirty cents. So just know what those are. Uh, Lewis Howard, I wish he was here. Me and him talk about this a lot. Aim for that average selling price. And some people do this by getting in pools. Some of the cotton guys are, are in pool deals and they benefit from a good average price through the year. Some folks are paying outside companies 10, 12 cent a bushel to manage their risk for them on their corn and beans. And they're going to offer them a price that might not be as high as what Nash or Smithfield could offer a Crestwood right now, but they're going to take a, a good average during the year. And the thing with that, when you're out spraying or worried about whatever in July and August when the market does go crazy, if you've paid somebody to manage that for you, they make the call at the right time. You don't get back from doing whatever in the field and realize something three days ago, I should have locked some corn in. I missed the opportunity. In a market like this, corn going on a 30 cent run is huge. You might think that isn't a lot when you see it drop too, but if it goes back up 30, you might not want to miss that in a two or three day period. So could be some advantages in that. When you go after the extreme highs, you get the extreme lows with it. So you got to make a good balanced average across there and only play with some of that chasing that high. I saw this happen in the 90s. Cotton got up to about a dollar twenty, dollar twenty-five, and the next year the LDP payment was more than the board price for cotton. People knew it would go to a dollar fifty, then go to two dollars. It went to like twenty eight cents. So you gotta find that good average that works for you in there. This is another tool we've got. This you load in all your crops. If you got the back end sweet potatoes, if you're getting your budget, we can build that template out for you. But what it looks at, it gives you a total return on investment on your farm. It puts in all your projected expenses, all your projected income and income, and it tallies all that out depending on the acres you load in, and it shows your return on investment. This is something I can build for you, send to you, and allow you to use. My last slide, we're going to go to break. I borrowed this from the other week. It talks about the four prolific years in agriculture, and do we just see number five? When you look at this slide here, it's a little blurry, but what happened right before 1921? Anybody remember what ended right before that? World War I ended. It ended in 1918, and the world was in disarray, and the U.S. farmers were charged with feeding the world. Export demand went through the roof. Farm receipts went through the roof. Everything was great. We saw a replay of this. 1945, World War II ended. We saw the same thing again. There was a worldwide demand for food. Exports went up. Farmers were making money. They were printing it. They were putting it in jars and burying it in the backyard. Things were real good. We got a 1973 here, and it just about went off the chart right there. Exports really started to increase. At this time, the Soviet Union started buying from us, and that really increased export demand. 72 had been a terrible year, so domestically, there was a lot of need for corn in the U.S. to feed all our livestock there. So that was really up. Wheat, which is not on this chart, wheat alone was up close to 30% that year in exports. So that was a very good year for farmers. Of course, we all know what happened there. Whew. 2012, you see it. 
In the 90s, there were a few little blips there. There was a little increase for export. The dollar went down again. When the dollar goes down, it seems like commodity prices go up. But when you get to 2012, we're going to call that, as Dr. Heininger would, that's the year of ethanol. And that's when the ethanol thing went crazy. They were handing money out. All you had to do was sign up. Kind of reminds me of the solar thing right now. Anybody and everybody, if you said the word ethanol, they were going to send you a check. They were building plants everywhere. They were getting all that started. Demand was up. Dollar was down. And the ethanol thing took off. That didn't last real long. Kind of fell off again. And then we get to 21. Late 20, early 21, we come out of the COVID deal with CFAP money coming, with payback protection money coming in. Um, I said the CFAP, you got your WIP money coming in, trying to make up for some of the pressure we were putting on China there, trying to increase. So there was tons of money coming into the farm. And those had to be counted on the farm ledger with farm income. At the same time, we had a, a demand increase there, a food demand. And, an increase of goods, so there was good money made. Late 20, 21, 22, 23, we're sitting here in 24. Now if you look at this chart right here, it goes on about four year run, and then the bottom falls out. Four year run, the bottom falls out. Four year run, the bottom falls out. Market reset themselves, whether you're buying stocks or dealing with commodities, and then things get back up. My point of all of this, We've just been on a four-year run. We could be in what we're in right now for a while. I hope that's not the case. But I want you to look at your finances and be aware so you can weather the storm. And I don't want you using old accounting method, old numbers. And you end up one day, your boss calls and says, done, no more money for you. Why? I thought we were making money. Look at my budget. And the banker looks at your budget and says, bud, those numbers haven't been relevant for years. Having good finances is a tool when you go through those numbers. One, to get money, or two, to get a better interest rate when you do go. If you got your stuff together and it's relevant, it helps. Knowing what you are allows you to know what you need from us. How much risk protection do you need? What levels do you need to cover what deals you've got coming in to allow crop insurance to work for you? If you look in your black folder there, I did a thing. It's got some examples, and Ryan and Hudson will go to break, but it shows wheat, corn, beans, and cotton examples of how crop insurance works for you. Should be the first thing on the right hand side, but a couple of those are actual numbers from real people that live within 30 miles of here of where they have their crop insurance guarantee this time of year. They go in and produce their crop, they have a phenomenal yield but the market drops. You'd think in a normal year, we're not gonna get an indemnity payment. We made more bushels than our policy covered. But if you've got revenue protection and the market drops like it did, you stand to get another check. Let crop insurance work for you. If you don't understand how your policies work, choose one of us, that's what we're here for. To teach you how to do those things, how they work, and make sure you've got the kind of coverage that you want. We gone over a lot. I'm gonna hush. I can answer any questions or you can grab me at break, but we're gonna take about a 15 minute break here. Let everybody return phone calls, get some more drinks, go to the restroom. Any questions right off anybody has? Would you ever ask and not be in front of the class? <coughs> what? Right, go to break.